Well, if you get your outlines out with me today, I want to talk to you about living intentionally. And we're starting a series, A Life of Blessing. How many of you want to be blessed by the Lord? Amen. Let me just say this. Our inheritance is that of victory and it is that of blessing. Do you know that? You know why? Because we serve a God who loves us so much. He wants us to be blessed and he wants us to be victorious. And let me just say this. We as believers, we are called to go from victory to victory to victory. That's why when people, they, they walk into fear, they go from one problem to another problem to another. How many of you know people like that? Yeah, sometimes it's been us, but that's not what the Lord has for us. He wants us to go from victory to victory to victory. It doesn't mean that life's always going to be easy. It doesn't mean that it's always going to go our way. But it does mean that the Lord, our God, has everything we need for us from one second to the next. You know that. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about that today. In our text, the Apostle Peter, he begins talking about marriage relationships. And then he talks about all the other relationships as well. And relationships are important. Amen? Amen. Our relationship with the Lord, our relationship in our marriage, our relationship with family, relationship with friends, relationship with co-workers. And a lot of our lives are spent focused on relationships. And so I want to talk a little bit about that today because I believe it's such a big part of our life. And I think it's important that we talk about that. It's where a lot of our blessings uh, lie, if you will. And so the question is, what do you do when things no longer feel automatic? What do you do when a relationship that was healthy turns sour? So sometimes what begins at a, as a blessing can turn into a curse. And you don't know how it happened or what to do. Can the situation be fixed? And I want us to look at what, what Peter says about this in the first verse on your outline found in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. And it says this. To sum up, all of you be, say it with me, harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. blessing. And so the Lord wants us to inherit a blessing, and he, he gives us some things uh, to do in that blessing, and he gives us, first of all, a list of five qualities that should characterize any group of believers. So the first one is, is harmonious. Say that with me. Harmonious. harmonious. It, it, you know what it means, but it's having compassion, uh, being responsive to other people who are in need, uh, to be of um, uh, one mind, I'm sorry, harmonious, be of one mind, pursuing the same goals, being in har harmony, uh, sympathetic, that's having compassion, being responsive to others, and then brotherly, I, I love to see that, I've seen that in my wife's friend. brotherly love, someone who, who protects, someone who, who's just brotherly, who's caring, who's protecting who tries to bring harmony, and then uh, kind-hearted, tender-hearted, being sensitive to other people's needs, and then being humble in spirit, meaning being uh, courteous, not having to have your own way all the time. And so these characteristics really are a great precursor to that blessing. You want to have a blessed life. Again, I've seen my dad have a blessed life. And my, my dad was really great with all those. And so it is that we should be like that as well. Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And so he gives us a list of these things uh, that are important. So uh, Peter did not say be harmonious only if you feel like it. Right? You should be harmonious. You should be sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, regardless of how you feel. Amen? Because how many of you know we don't feel good all the time? We don't feel like being nice all the time. But it's not about feelings. It's about being faith. We want to be like Christ. And all of us can imagine Christ being like that, can't we? And so it's important 
that we try to focus on some of these because we need to live intentionally, right? Especially when a blessing becomes a curse and it can happen. Again, in marriages, in friendships, in families, even among Christians, God has an inheritance for us, but we need to forgive others in order to receive it. So see, the Lord has left tutors in the Bible to help us steward all that he has given us. So we have to live an intentional life to receive the blessing of inheritance. Again, the just shall live by faith, not by feelings. I mean, well, I feel like this, I feel like that, I feel like this. Well, what does God's word say about that? If people want to come for counseling, all I do is tell them, what does the word say about your situation? And that's what we need to correct back to the, the word. So, for example, in the early development of automobiles, there was only a manual transmission. It wasn't automatic transmission, it was a manual transmission. How many of you guys are old enough to remember this when you had to manually roll up your windows? You remember that? How many of you remember rolling up your windows? You guys are old. Anyway, I don't remember that. Hey, how about, how about automatic door locks where you had to reach over and unlock the door for somebody? Now, now they're automatic. You, you could be walking to your car and, and open it up, right? Is this automatic? And some cars start up and turn the air conditioning, and the air conditioning is automatically going when it's 107 by cellular. Yeah. And so we see that automatically. The radio automatically. It tunes automatically. Uh, doors lock automatically. Soon cars will even grab you, pick you up, set you in the seat, and drive by themselves, right? Automatically. And so how many of you know life is the opposite of that? It goes from everything being automatic in the beginning to hopefully intentionally later. Hmm. When you were a baby, somebody fed you automatically. When you were a baby, somebody washed the sheets and cleaned the clothes automatically. You were taken to school automatically. Your first love, automatically. You didn't have to work at it at all. You could stare at your young love, and she would stare back with adoration. Now, if you stare at your wife, she'll yell back, what are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> to maintain marriage, love, faith, and devotion, we have to intentionally, even in our relationship with the Lord, how many of you know some of those things don't come automatic? That's right. In our relationship with the Lord, he says, train yourself to be godly. Hmm. And so there is something that when you're a new believer, it's automatic. You're in that love relationship and it's automatic. And then all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more difficult where you actually have to work at it. Whether it's our relationship with the Lord, relationship to marriage, relationship with kids, relationship with friends. How many of you know you have to intentionally have friends nowadays because everybody's so busy? It's difficult, isn't it? And so we have to be intentional in maintaining our relationships. We have to do things intentionally to preserve those things that are worthwhile. And again, it's no longer automatic, but blessing will be returned to us if we live an intentional life. Intentional love is not a feeling. Love is always what? A choice. And that's why you don't say, I fell out of love. No, you choose. You make a commitment to always love. Amen? Amen? And so love is a choice. Would you write this down? Blessings follow an intentional life. You have to be int intentional at everything you do. Otherwise, you just kind of bump around in life. And you're, 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 you know, you're just going to take the path of least resistance. And, and nothing ever gets taken care of that way. You have to be intentional. You have to go out and do what you're called uh, to do. Lots of things are easy in the beginning. Even becoming a Christian. Like I said, people love you. You come into church, you feel loved and all those type of things. But look what it says in Luke uh, 6.32. He says this, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? 
even sinners love those who love them. So he's challenging us to love even those who are not lovable. Those we maybe don't want to be around family members and those type of things. Find people and love them and you'll find something change in your heart. Be intentional to go out and to love one another. And then write this down. Live by what you know. No longer by how you feel. Talking to somebody, well, I, I don't feel this anymore, and I don't feel love anymore for my husband, and I don't feel this, and I don't, but they know, they know, they know the word, and there's a big conflict between how they feel and what the word of God says. And again, what people do, they'll justify, how many of you know we have the ability to justify, any of you have ever justified anything, raise your hand. How many of you are lying to me? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what we do is we change God's word to match our behavior instead of changing our behavior to match God's word. Hmm. Romans 1.17 says this. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Faith. That's where we take God's word and we say, you know what, I know I feel like this, but God's word trumps my feeling. The obedience to God's word, because that's where we trust that God knows what's best for us in life. That's where faith is. Because my feelings doesn't always match God's word, so instead of changing God's word, I have to change my feelings to say, you know what, I feel like this, but maybe that ain't right. How many, how many know our, our feelings can mislead you? Right. Amen. Wow. I've seen it happen. Somebody's feelings misled them until they ruined and they said out of their own lips, I blew up my life. Because they went with their feelings instead of going with God's word. God's word is a love letter to his people. He loves us, and so he gives that to us that we might follow, that the blessing of the living God would follow us. Look, I don't, I don't put God's blessing in front of me and kind of follow that blessing. You follow the Lord, you follow the Lord, and the blessing will follow you wherever you go. Amen. You, you see blessed people? You see blessed people? They're following the Lord. God gives them wisdom and blessing and honor. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody's done you something wrong and you know that you gotta forgive them, but you don't feel like it? <laughs> Isn't that true? I, I mean, that's, that's, that's the last thing we're thinking about is forgiving that person. The first thing is choking them, slapping them. No. <laughs> but that's where God's word comes in. That he says, he says something. <laughs> but let me read this verse in Genesis 4, 7 before I get there. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? How many of you know when you do good and you know that you're doing good, your countenance is good? I see it all the time. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. See, we have to master those things. We may feel like doing this wrong because your flesh is crying out, feed me. We may feel like doing it wrong, but that's where we come in faith and go, you know what? That's not the best way. That's not God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. And that's where we, we make that commitment. We make that decision. Because that's where the sweet spot is. That's where the blessing of the Lord comes in, and we all want to be blessed, I know. So three steps to live intentional lives. Would you write this down, number one? Forgive quickly. Forgive quickly. He says this in Matthew 5.44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Again, 
we have to get out of the natural, walk in the natural, because the, the natural tendency for the world is not to get mad, but get even, right? And so that's, that's kind of where the conflict is. That's what the world philosophy is. But the Lord says we are to, to what? Love your enemies. Love, how many of you know you have to be a little bit intentional to love your enemies? Yeah. Hmm. And pray for those who persecute you. Lord, pray that that big, huge rock will fall on them. In Jesus' name. <laughs> no. Hmm. Wow. That's hard. Because in the beginning of a, of a relationship, how many of you know in the beginning of a relationship, it's easy to forget? Right? You're maybe dating, your girlfriend forgets the car keys. Hmm. And then later, years go by, your wife forgets the car keys. You say, what's the matter for you? <laughs> yeah. Forgiveness in relationships have to become intentional. Why does God say forgiveness is important? Well, I remember one time, boy, somebody was just kind of harassing me, going out of their way. Uh, uh, I do not get offended, but there are people that will go out of your way, right? And I was just praying about it, and, and your natural tendency is to say, how can I get even, right? I mean, without even thinking about it, revenge can come uh, in your mind. But God will stop you, and he will say, forgive. And I remember time he said, Brian, how do I forgive you? See, when God talks to you, he usually asks you a question. <laughs> How does God forgive us? Freely, quickly. How are we called to forgive others? Freely and quickly. Look what it says in Mark eleven twenty five. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Why does he say that? so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you of your transgressions. So in other words, he's saying, how can I forgive you if you're not willing to forgive another? And Jesus goes into that illustration where, where this guy owed the king millions and millions of dollars. In fact, it was a debt he could never pay. He did not have the resources nor the ability to pay the king everything he owed him. Sound familiar? That's us. There is a debt of our sins you and I could never pay. Jesus paid it for us. And so he comes to the king and he begs for mercy. Oh king, forgive my debt, forgive my debt. And the king had mercy upon him and he forgave the debt. Of a debt he could not pay. And yet he goes to another guy just a little while later, finds somebody who, who owes him a couple hundred bucks. And, and he's like getting him in a headlock saying, man, you owe me $200. I'm not going to let you go until you give it to me. And the king found out about it. And the king was upset. He says, I have forgiven you this much. You mean since I had mercy upon you and forgave you a debt this big, you couldn't have this much mercy on your neighbor who owed you something? And so that's what he challenges us to do. And one of the, the greatest things we do as believers, one of the hardest things we do as believers, is forgiveness, isn't it? It's forgiveness because we want our way, we want this, we want... Forgive quickly. And then the second stage is pray for them early on. Pray for them early on. Look what it says in Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Wow. Again, it's an upside down kingdom, isn't it? It's like none of these things are natural for us. That's where we have to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh. Because the flesh will not want to bless those who curse you. We want to curse those who curse us even more than they curse us. And those who mistreat us, we want to mistreat them back. 
But Jesus says, no, we don't do that. And can you imagine Jesus allowed them to mistreat the Lord? I was talking about this with Beth the other day. The power of God that restrained himself when he was being beaten and knelt to a cross. I mean, the, the Lord could have zapped them big time right then and there. Can you imagine the restraint he had to allow them to nail him to a cross for the sacrifice of all of our sins? Oh. And he says, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is important. Pray for them. Pray for those who mistreat you. Hmm. Even our prayers can change over the years, can't they? There was this one woman, she says, you know, the, the first year of marriage I prayed, oh Lord, thank you for my wonderful husband. She says the second year she prayed, oh Lord, help my husband to be a better man. The third year, she said, Lord, pluck his eyes out. No, no, no. <laughs> Listen, prayer is reciprocal. If we pray for something good for another person, then there's something about healing for us. Let me just say this. When we pray for other people, did, did the people nailing Jesus to a cross deserve forgiveness? Absolutely not. Did they deserve it? No. But he gave it to them anyway. You know why? Forgiveness is not for that person. Forgiveness is for us. If we, you know why we forgive quickly? Because the more you hold on to forgiveness, the more you become like the person that you're trying to forgive. It's just the truth. And there's something of tying you to something that's exactly why Jesus, listen, freed himself from everything. When he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. I mean, he was forgiving all mankind. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I believe he had the ability to think of every single person and all of us at that one given time. Father, forgive the whole universe. Forgive them. Not just those. Forgive us for the time we were selfish and we sin against the Lord. Oh, but we're called to pray for them early on. Look what it says in James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. You know what? We want to be clean and free when we pray for others. Amen. So that's why we have to live like that, to live in that freedom. And then the third and last point in probably the greatest stage, you write this down. Bless them. Bless them. You know, as we go through forgiveness, it's hard to forgive. And some people, you know, I, you know, I forgive them and then... You, how many of you ever had this happen? You forgive them, and then that thought comes back again, and your heart races, and you want to choke them all over again, yeah. right? And so it, it's like it comes back. And, and I think the point we know in which we forgive them, if we could do point number three, and that's bless them. Because how many of you know that is so hard to do? Come on. We bless them. There's a reason why we bless them. Let me tell you this story. It's a story of, a familiar story of Joseph. And I, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is that of Joseph. And the kids are going to be doing a, a seven-week program on the life of Joseph. It's going to be phenomenal. But Joseph, who is a type of Christ in the Bible, Joseph, who was hated by his brothers, as Jesus was hated by his Jewish brothers, he was so hated, they tried to, they were going to kill him. They threw him in a pit. And then they sold him into slavery for 30 pieces of silver, interesting enough. And yet he goes 
And the Lord says that one day your family's going to bow down to him. He told that to his brothers. They hated him even more. <laughs> and they sold him. When the older brother said, you know, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. Let's not have his blood on our hands. So they sold him to the Ishmaelites headed to Egypt. And so as he's going to Egypt, wherever he goes, he walks and lives in the presence of the Lord. And here's what happened. I believe Joseph forgave his brothers because I believe Joseph, listen to this, saw the big picture. And I will say this to you, you have to see the big picture. Jesus saw the big picture. Father, forgive them. A lot of times, how many of you know we're focused in our little old situation, right? And we're not looking at the big picture. When we forgive, I believe we're giving glory and honor to, to God because it, it, it's only because of God that we can forgive, right? It's only because of God that we can bless. And so he's there, and the reason why I get the indication that he forgave his brothers kind of early on was the fact that wherever he was, when he was in Egypt, sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites, and then he was sold to Potiphar, he thrived. He thrived in the midst of slavery. He thrived. And God blessed him. But then, you know what, for doing what was right, he was thrown into prison. He was thrown into prison. How many of you get really ticked off at your brothers at that point? But you know what? I think somehow, some way, he was okay with it. You know why? Because he thrived in prison. They put him in charge of all the other guys. He's there. He's working hard. If you're bitter, and you're, you're not going to work hard for what you're doing, right? But he thrived where God put him because he had no choice. If you don't have a choice, that means God's at work. Now, if you did it yourself, that's a whole other, another story. But he's there, and he thrives. And then he tells a dream. See, God was up to something in the big picture. You know what God was up to? He was training him on a fast track to be second in command of all of Egypt. Pretty big deal. And so here Joseph is in the palace. And was ironic, there was a famine in his land, so he saw his brothers coming to get food, and he recognized his brothers. So he brought his brothers in, close. He brought them in, and he revealed who he was. And look at this verse here in Genesis 50, 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them, and he spoke, what? <laughs> Kindly to them. Oh, boy, I, I tell you, some people, given that same situation, would have been so fiery hot, red hot, would have tortured them or put their heads off. This Joseph had the ability to do that. He was in the palace second in command. Only one person had more authority than him, and that was a pharaoh. And yet, he chooses to bless his brothers. Wow. How many of you know that is a great indication to see that Joseph forgave his brothers because he blessed them? What you meant for evil against me, God turned it around for good. Listen, what people meant evil against you, God can turn around anything for good. That's the greatness about, about God. It's, it's like a cat. When I was a kid, I was always amazed at this. You take a cat, you turn them upside down, you, you drop them, they stand on their feet. You could do it in a second story building and they still land on their feet. I've seen it. I've seen it. No animals were injured in the context of the sermon. So you know. So write this down. The blessing is about our faith, not about our feelings. It wasn't about how Joseph felt. It was about Joseph's faith. Because Joseph said, I will not sin against my master. And he says, and more importantly, listen, I will not sin in the presence of my God. See, wherever Joseph was, he was working for the Lord. 
because the Lord was right there. He knew it. He knew the Lord had a hand upon his life. Do you know that even when things go bad, you know the Lord still has his hand upon your life? Usually, the Lord wants to teach you something. But all those things can be turned around for good. Amen? Amen. Look at the last verse here this morning in Luke 10, 5 and 6. Whenever you enter someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. And if those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing, say it with me, will return to you. Wow. Isn't that, it's an awesome verse. He's saying, you go around and you bless those people who are around you. And if they're worthy of the blessing, the blessing will sit. And if it doesn't, then the blessing will come upon you. Again, if you bless someone deserving, then God will work wonders with that blessing. But if that person is undeserving, then that blessing will return to you. So let me give you some advice. Give the biggest blessing you can to everyone, and you'll be blessed by God. Just go around and just bless people. Bless people. They're not deserving to come to you. So I find people who are terrible. No. no. But listen, I, I, I tell you, I, I do this, and I, I know other people in the church. Pastor, God bless you. Man, I receive that blessing. I receive that blessing. And I bless other people. Boy, God bless you. For all you, God bless you. Yeah. And I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Amen. Amen. Then give that blessing away. And if they don't deserve it, it's going to come back on you. I, I love that verse because I want to be blessed by God. And it, it doesn't cost you anything. You know, I go to my kids. Honey, God bless you. For all that you do to serve the Lord. God bless you for your faithfulness. God bless you for doing without, but you still have a heart for God. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless your kids. Bless your wife. Bless your husband. Bless your friends and your family. Bless those people at church. Everywhere you go, be a blessing. Amen? Amen. Because we are, listen, everywhere we go, we are blessed of the living God. And so be a blessing. So listen, blessings follow an intentional life. Live by what you know, no longer by how you feel. And so Christians must live an intentional life. The first stage of an intentional life is forgive quickly. The second one, pray for those who hurt you early on. And then the greatest stage, bless them. The blessing is about our faith. The blessing is about our faith, not about our feelings. So don't worry whether they deserve it or not. God knows. That's for God to dissect. It's for God to judge. It's for God to delineate. We bless and God takes care of the rest. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as the worship team comes? Lord, thank you. Lord, that we live lives of blessing. Lord, I pray that you would bless and give wisdom to our leaders of our nation, of our president, of our congressmen, of all those. Lord, may your blessing rest upon them. May your blessing rest upon our nation. Lord, help us to follow your word that says this day I give you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey me and a curse if you disobey me. Lord, may we be a nation of obedience to you, acknowledging you in all our ways. The days of old when we would say in God we trust, Lord, may they return to our nation that we might see revival in our land. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that we would follow in the blessing of our own lives, that we would, Lord, bless you and honor you by being obedient to you. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for blessing us, Lord, even when we don't deserve it, you bless us. And Lord, help us to be a blessing to those around us. And Lord, especially to those who are closest to us. Sometimes that is the most difficult. Lord, bless our spouses. Bless our families. Bless our relationships in our families, Lord. That sometimes there can be something strained. Lord, help us to forgive those who have hurt us. 
many of us have been hurt to the very core of our existence. And Lord, if we've hurt others, Lord, forgive us. Lord, help us to forgive ourselves for our shortcomings, for selfishness. Lord, we honor you. We glorify you. Forgive us of our sins. We love you, Lord. Bless those, Lord, who have hurt us. Bless them. And we know, Lord, you are the great judge. And Lord, that forgiveness frees us all up. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. So, Lord, set us all free from hurt, from our hang-ups, Lord. But we love you and we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.